The White House, Wall Street, and our central bank keep talking about how strong our economy will be in 2024 and beyond, and how we can have the soft landing by bypassing a recession even after the high inflation and the higher interest rates. But there are some major red flags in our economy that most people are overlooking right now. I'll show you. There are three economic factors that we'll start to see come together in 2024 and into 2025. Number one is the inevitable credit crunch after the multi-trillion dollar debt mountain that we created during the pandemic. Number two is the delayed impact of higher interest rates on unemployment and the job market. And number three is the cost of living dilemma where inflation is still high and wages are starting to fall. Now, the goal of this video isn't to make you feel scared or panicked, but rather to give you a more holistic view of what's happening in the economy right now, because the reality is there are economic opportunities in every stage of our economy, but the only people that can capitalize on these opportunities are the ones that are aware of them and know how to capitalize on them. So let's jump in, starting with the credit crisis, and I'm sorry if I sound a little stuffy. I'm recovering from a little cold right now, and I'm still in London traveling, doing some stuff over here. So that's why I got the different background. But let's start by talking about the credit crisis. The first part of this credit crunch has to do with corporations, because every corporation during the pandemic boom was going out and borrowing tons of money for very cheap because of 2020, 2021, and the first half of 2022, interest rates were at their lowest levels ever. So every business said, oh, you mean I can go out and borrow millions or billions of dollars at two, three, four percent interest? Sign me up. So you saw this huge debt mountain get created with corporations during that pandemic boom. The problem is corporations don't have the flexibility of generally getting a 30-year fixed rate mortgages. These are three, four, five, six, seven-year loans that readjust. And now the interest rates are so much higher. Well, we are starting to see this first wave of corporate debt readjustments going to happen in 2024. And you'll see it even more accelerate in 2025. And so if interest rates stay high, in 2024 and 2025, which is what the Federal Reserve Bank says will likely need to happen to fight inflation. If interest rates stay high, that means all these corporations that are sitting on these huge piles of debt are going to see their debt payments skyrocket. Why? Well, it doesn't mean that they're going on borrowing more money, but because the cost of their current debt, the cost of servicing this debt is going to go up. That means every single business that is sitting on large piles of debt is going to see a big increase in their expenses in the next 24 months, assuming interest rates stay high. But it's not just corporations, it's also commercial landlords. And they're facing a unique dilemma because just like corporations, if you go out and you invest in commercial real estate, you're generally not getting a 25 or 30 year mortgage. Many times you're getting a five year loan that's going to readjust. And well, we have a multi-trillion dollar problem here as well, where a lot of corporate landlords either went out and bought properties or refinanced their properties when interest rates are very low. Now, this allowed a lot of corporate landlords to lower their costs during the pandemic boom because you could get interest rates much lower. However, now over the next 24 months, as more and more of these debts start to readjust, Well, the costs on these corporate landlords are also going to rise. Now, generally, what you would do as a landlord when your costs rise is you're going to push this cost down to your tenants. You just raise your rents. But the difficult part here is we're also seeing a shift in the commercial market, the commercial real estate market, particularly the office market, because... Well, a lot of offices are sitting 25 to 50 percent vacant thanks to the new hybrid work style or change in IFAS dynamic. So now, if you are a landlord sitting on an office building and now your office is 25, 30, 50 percent vacant and now you're sitting on millions of dollars of debt and the debt starts to readjust, and your payments are rising, you don't have the ability to raise your rents because you don't want your tenants to leave, and you have all these vacancies. So now you're already in a situation where you're struggling making your mortgage payments, you're struggling making the expenses as it is, and now your expenses start to go up. You can start to see why this will be an issue, especially for offices in the coming years. This is where partially the White House is trying to save the commercial landlords because they came out with this uh, pseudo bailout where they created this multi-billion dollar program to allow office owners, office real estate investors to convert some of their office space into residential with subsidized mortgages and potentially free money through grants because it's a way now to help office landlords to prevent this type of bankruptcy or default. 
the third part of this credit crunch has to do with banks. And if we go back to the early part of 2023, when we saw Silicon Valley Bank fail and a couple of their banks fail, the reason why these banks were failing in the early part of 2023 was because many of these banks, like Silicon Valley Bank, were number one, sitting on underwater assets. And then when the people that borrowed money from Silicon Valley Bank, in that case, it was tech companies, startup companies, when they lost the ability to make their payments, the bank started to struggle financially. And because the bank was sitting on underwater assets, assets, they couldn't go out and raise more money, so they were forced to shut their doors and they defaulted. Now the question is, what assets were these banks sitting on that were underwater? And these were bonds, particularly treasury bonds, aka loans that you make to the government. And the way that the bond market works is that as interest rates rise, bond prices generally fall. So now, the reason why a lot of these banks like Silicon Valley Bank were sitting on underwater assets was because interest rates have risen so much. And this caused the banks like Silicon Valley Bank to be sitting on underwater assets so they couldn't go out and raise more money. Now, what has happened since Silicon Valley Bank? We've seen interest rates rise even further, which means bond prices have fallen further, which means that other commercial banks are sitting underwater on these assets. And if you start to see more pain in the economy and people can't keep making their payments to the bank. Maybe it's commercial landlords. Maybe it's businesses. If people lose the ability to make their payments to the bank and banks can't go out and raise more money because they're underwater on their assets, you can start to see how this could create more issues in the banking sector because the issues that created the banking crisis in the early part of 2023, which was the higher interest rates, haven't gotten better. In fact, they've gotten worse because interest rates have gone up even more. And a lot of people have completely ignored or forgotten what happened with the higher interest rates and banks being underwater on these treasuries. But that issue is still there. And this is something you want to remember that if banks see less income coming in, they might have a difficult time trying to go out and raise more money. Now that we've covered what's going on with the credit crunch, let's talk about the impacts of higher interest rates and the delayed impact of higher interest rates on the economy. By the way, if you are interested in ways that you can improve your financial education, my team at Briefs Media put together an amazing ebook titled How to Build Wealth as an Investor that you can read for free. This ebook goes over a lot of things, things like how do you build a mindset of an investor to how do you start saving your money as an investor, to how do you invest your money, how do you generate cash flow, what are the different ways that you can invest, to how do you spend your money smartly, how do you earn more money, and how do you protect your your assets. This ebook is completely free. So if you want to get a copy of this ebook, all you got to do is click the link down in the description below or go to briefs.co slash ebook. The reason why the Federal Reserve Bank raises interest rates to cool down inflation is because when everybody has money to spend, you see the demand for things go up, right? Because everybody has money, you'll see big lines at the Gucci store. When there's big lines at the Gucci store, Gucci will sell out of their products and then they'll start raising the price of the products because, well, they don't want everybody to have a Gucci bag, although they kind of do want that. But you know what I'm trying to say. They don't want every single person to have a Gucci bag, so they have to raise the prices of their products. So, when the Federal Reserve Bank raises interest rates, what happens? That cools down demand. Why? Because it makes spending money more expensive. Why? Because your credit card debt becomes more expensive. Your home mortgage becomes more expensive. Your car payment becomes more expensive. And so when you have higher interest rates, spending starts to cool down. What does that mean? Well, now, if you're cooling down spending because you got to spend more money in your housing, you got to spend more money in your car, you're not going to have that same money to go out and splurge at Gucci, which means now less lines at Gucci, which means a cool down in spending and a cool down inflation. That's why the Federal Reserve Bank raises interest rates. But there are impacts to this because our economic system runs on spending. If everybody has the money to go out and stand in line to buy Gucci, what does that mean? Gucci is going to, number one, want to open up more stores. Number two, they're going to commission creating more handbags. And number three, they're going to want to hire more salespeople to keep selling their stuff. So if everybody's spending money at Gucci, Gucci's got the money to hire more people and to expand and to continue building their operations, which means more people have jobs and their business is booming. But when sales are slowing, it's the opposite. Now, maybe Gucci has to shut down their stores. Maybe they got to lay off some of their employees and their associates. Maybe they don't commission as many handbags. And so some of their manufacturers or their suppliers start to lose revenue. Maybe they have to downsize as well. So our economic system runs on spending. And just now, towards the tail end of 2023, are we starting to see the impacts 
of these higher interest rates on the jobs market. Because number one, what we're starting to see happen is that companies are hiring less people and they've slowed down their hiring. We've seen this pretty much across the board now in many different sectors where companies aren't hiring the same way that they were before. And then on the flip side, you're not seeing the same wage growth that we saw before. In fact, wage growth has been slowing month after month after month after month after month. And some companies are even cutting salaries for some of their new employees. Why? Because it's a completely different dynamic in the job market. Before, in 2020, 2021, and even to 2022, it was in the full hand of the employee. Employees had the full reign where you had more negotiating room. You had the ability to ask for more benefits. You had the ability to do kind of a lot more negotiating because employers were desperate for employees. Now it's starting to flip where employers don't see that same need for more and more employees like they did before. Why? Because spending is slowing. Their profits are slowing. So they're slowing down their growth. And now as the employee, as more and more companies are downsizing, you're having less negotiating room and less of that kind of upper hand room. And so now we're starting to see that employment growth slow. Companies are hiring less. Companies are starting to downsize. And wage growth is also starting to slow down. And if interest rates stay high, you can expect this trend to continue into 2024, which could result in higher unemployment. Higher unemployment means more people don't have a job. If more people don't have a job, well, that naturally has an impact on the economy, which brings me to point number three, spending. And I want to start by talking about inflation because the interesting thing about inflation is you have a lot of people touting how inflation is cooling down. But there's a few things I want you to remember about inflation. Number one is that inflation compounds. And number two, cooling inflation does not mean the prices of things are falling. It means that the prices of things are rising less fast. And today, at the time when we're recording this video, the prices of things are still rising faster than most people's wages. So now, when we talk about inflation compounding, what does this mean? The inflation that we're seeing today isn't in a bubble. This is on top of the inflation that we saw in the early part of 2023. This is on top of the inflated inflation, the high inflation that we saw in 2022. This is on top of the high inflation that we saw in 2021. And this is on top of the inflation that we saw in 2020. So when we talk about inflation cooling, you got to remember, people have not seen their wages rise as fast as in inflation in the last number of years. But in the last few years, inflation has been extremely hot. And each year, inflation compounded on top of one another. Now, here we are at the end of 2023, and everybody's talking about, yes, inflation is cooling down. But that does not mean the prices of things are falling. It just means the prices of things are rising less fast. And it's on top of all the previous years of above average, extremely far above average inflation. So now today, we still have high inflation, still higher than many people's wage growth and still higher than the Federal Reserve Bank's expectations. And this is on top of the previous year's inflation, which means more and more people have less money to spend on themselves, have less money to save, have less money to invest because they have to spend more money on their housing, on their travel, and on their groceries. And the way that many people have been coping with these higher expenses was digging into things like credit cards, which is why we've seen a record high amount of credit card debt today. Now, eventually, that hits a breaking point. You can't keep going deeper and deeper and deeper into credit card debt indefinitely. Eventually, you're going to max out, and you can't keep spending more money. In fact, it was interesting. We saw spending slow down in October, which was a very interesting and surprise thing. But what happened in October, which could have contributed to the slowing in spending? Well, maybe it was the fact that student loans restarted. So now you had millions of Americans in October who saw a brand new three, four, five, six hundred dollar payment that they had to start paying again that they didn't have to pay for years. So we still have high inflation. We have more and more consumer debt. Americans now have to pay their student loans again, which is an additional charge on top of the high inflation. And now we're seeing a slowdown in the job market. What does that mean? Well, all these things contribute to slower spending and APC slower spending that can lead to a higher unemployment, which leads to a slower economy. This is why I want you to understand the different factors that are happening right now. Are we still seeing spending happen? Yes. Are we still seeing growth in the economy? Yes. Are we still seeing people spend like crazy? Yes. All these things are great for the economy today. Not so good for the spender, not so good for the consumer, good for the economy, good for the investor, good for the financially educated. However, you gotta remember, there's only so much that people can spend, especially when you're spending faster than your income growth, which is what we're seeing happen. 
And if people keep digging into credit card debt, if people keep digging into the life savings, if people keep digging into the 401ks, eventually people will hit a breaking point. When is that breaking point? I don't know. But these are the things that I want you to understand and that we have these red flags in the economy that I want you to remember and understand because our economy is a very large puzzle. It's not just one thing. And I want you to be financially educated that way you don't get blindsided by anything and that way you can capitalize on opportunities that might come your way. That's why I've been saying 2023 is not the year for you to go out and finance a truck. 2023 is the year for you to get financially smart. That way you can start building that financial education and build a financial preparedness to capitalize on opportunities that might be coming your way. Everybody was following the banking crisis when Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank collapsed because of their underwater assets. But these quote, underwater assets have not gotten better for many other banks. In fact, they've gotten worse and most people are ignoring this. Take a look. When the banking crisis was happening in the early part of 2023, there were two main triggers for this.